Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the Motor One Podcast. Cadillac recently introduced two new V models, the CT4V and CT5V. The basis of these cars replace the ATS and the CTS in Cadillac's lineup, but these high-performance V versions left all of us scratching our heads. Where did all the horsepower go? Joining me this week to discuss this and other automotive news is managing editor Brandon Turkus. How are you doing, Brandon? I am doing very well, John. And filling in the final chair is writer, photographer, video gamer, collector of scale model and RC cars, Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? Uh, I sold my RC car. I'm in the market for a new one, among other things that we'll discuss later. But I'm good. We want to jump into this Cadillac news because they've really dominated much of this week in the automotive world because... They surprised us late last week with the debut of two new models. We had already seen the CT5. This is the mid to full size sedan that they have introduced to replace the Cadillac CTS. We hadn't seen the CT4 at all. And for whatever reason, they decided to debut the V version, the CT4V, first before we could see the regular car and alongside it they debuted the ct5v as well so here's the controversial part about them the ct4v is powered by a 2.7 liter turbocharged four cylinder 320 horsepower and the ct5v has a twin turbo v6 producing 355 horsepower now i'm not one to dog on any cars horsepower rating those are decent horsepower ratings but the Two cars that they replace, uh, the previously uh, the previous V models, the CTS-V and the ATS-V, produced gobs of horsepower, um, nearly t- twice as much <laughs> as the, the, the CTS-V uh, compared to the CT5V. So that has us all asking where did the horsepower go? So Brandon, you were, you were at the event where they debuted these two cars. Um, what was your first thought and what was the reaction in the room? I mean, the the reaction in the room was uh, was composed, but after the you know there weren't any it wasn't uh, there wasn't any booing or people freaking out or shouting or anything like that. But as soon as as soon as the debut was over, there were there were definitely a lot of other media that were there scratching their heads. Cadillac has turned the V brand into this kind of just sledgehammer of of a trim level that just beats the hell out of the competition with sheer power. It's it's been that way since the original CTS V. And so seeing this, seeing two cars that are so far down on output is is definitely confusing. Um I I drove there, I drove to the event in a 450 horsepower BMW M4, a vehicle that the CTS or a CT4 V should be competing with that's the ATSV competed with it, but it was very surprising to just hear that 320 horsepower was what we were getting. It didn't feel like a V car. And if you looked at the cars in person, they didn't look like V cars either. Yeah. They were pretty kind of sedate in their styling or at least sedate in the, what, what's been added to their styling to make them, them V vehicles. Chris, we, we, we had another development too at the Detroit Grand Prix. Can you tell us about that? It, it almost seems like it was an afterthought on Cadillac's part, perhaps after seeing some of these scratching head reactions that at the Grand Prix, they showed up with a couple other prototypes that we don't really know a lot about, but supposedly they could be the quote unquote real V versions, which could then also become Blackwing. That's sort of the other debate that's going on right now. The question um, is Cadillac going to rebrand its ultra high performance line has Blackwing instead of just being the engine that we've seen uh, for the CT6. That would, in effect, make the current V series a replacement for the V Sport series, perhaps, which uh, which previously was the kind of the 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 middle of the road. I mean, it, it makes sense seeing these cars with these horsepower levels not being the real high performance end all be all machines but the whole thing it just it's oh it's it's just a train wreck i think that i think we need to preface this by saying though that i don't think any of us necessarily have an issue with the cars none of us have driven the cars we don't know how good or how bad they might actually be 
Oh, you're you're absolutely right. I and honestly, I think they look they look pretty darn good, and they could drive well. The bigger problem, and I was I was at the Grand Prix. Obviously, I live in Detroit, and I wandered down there, and I was actually at there as a guest of Cadillac. So the the problem that I've kind of had with this entire thing is that Cadillac has more or less just botched the messaging of of the this debut. Um, if they had come out and said that you know this is the start of a new generation of V cars, where we're going to have, if they had just said full stop that we are going to have multiple power levels of V, they're all going to be V products. But some of them are going to be more accessible. Some of some of them are going to be less powerful. If they said that we are broadening V instead of just dropping these cars with without any context and then rushing to bring the cars to the Grand Prix. And I say rushing because, like I said, I was there as a guest of Cadillac. I received an invite to go to the Grand Prix with them probably two and a half weeks prior if they had been bringing the cars, if they had said, we are going to have the other V cars there doing demo runs, please make sure that you're there for it. It's going to be really cool. I obviously would have been there, but there was no communication. It wasn't until I got there at about 1130 in the morning in time for the, the IMSA race that I found out the, the cars had even run. It wasn't communicated to any of us, to any of the media that were there. It sounds like Cadillac bringing the prototype of the, the, the really high horsepower versions of the CT5 and, and CT4, that that was probably last minute and in reaction, uh, a reaction to the feedback they got from, from showing the CT5V and the CT4V the week before. It absolutely feels that way. I agree with you, Brandon, that I think it this was a, a botched kind of messaging. Like Like, there's definitely... I think the blame falls on on sort of the marketing department for the way this was uh, rolled out and presented. I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily fair to assign blame to one department. I mean the 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 screw ups on this are are pretty widespread. I mean public relations and marketing screwed up the screwed up the messaging, product planning, and screwed up by not just saying to us that look there are more coming. This is just the start of a new movement for V. But I don't think it was just the messaging. I don't think it was just like the way it was presented and not giving context or saying what's going to happen next. I, I don't think playing with these brand names w- is a good idea. Oh, I completely agree. That's that's a leadership issue. Preach on. I'm with you. They built the the V name uh, ever since the first CTS V, and they'd done a great job. Those were those all of those vehicles were critical, if not sales successes as as well. They were they 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 handily uh, I won't say handily they performed extremely well against their German rivals at at a time when people really didn't expect American cars to do that. Um, so there was a lot of brand equity there. And what they decided to do was, okay, we're going to take the, the, the naming scheme that is CTS dash V. We're going to take the dash V and what they had decided to do already was to expand. Remember a few years ago, they expanded the V name to, to include V sport, which was like a less powerful version. So we already had two levels of V. So now we still have two levels of V except they took the name of the high power one and moved it down to the lower power one, and they're replacing it with Blackwing. Like, that's just needlessly confusing and damaging the brand equity they had already built and and the recognition they had already built. So now everybody's got to learn um, these new names and has to have to deal with the confusion that the lower horsepower one has the same name as the old high horsepower one. And you have to remember, too, that this is, this is just the latest in a string of really questionable decisions on on Cadillac's part. I mean, it started with going ahead and renaming their, changing their alphanumeric so that we would have CT numeral for, for the sedans and XT numeral for, for the crossovers. And then it, it proceeded on with the XT4 and the XT6 lacking super. To be fair, cruise. that was now, that was a long time ago that they started I, the I know, but, but, the, but my point is that this is this has been an ongoing case of them making just decisions that don't really make a great deal of sense outside of the Cadillac boardroom. You look at the XT4 and XT6 lacking super cruise went for lunch. Then you have the CT4V and the CT5V coming out and saying, you know, these are V cars and they'll have super crews. And so you have these less powerful versions 
with no communication about where they'll slot into the hierarchy, carrying an active safety system that you're not even offering on your family oriented crossovers. And that at a debut last year in New York, they said, we won't offer this on a performance model because performance models are about driving. It's all just, all of it has just been really questionable decisions from the leadership at Cadillac. And I, I don't really know, you know, who's running the show over there. It doesn't seem like anyone is. It's, it's, it's a, well, a mess. We've, we've been talking about the messaging and the marketing and the PR. Um, and that's, that's one issue, like all of this confusion and um, kind of conflicting or contradictory uh, statements they make. If we talk about the product, I look at Cadillac as having been kind of at a turning point a few years ago. And, and I feel like they've been turning <laughs> maybe the wrong way. And let me, let me put it this way. So a few years ago, they had a killer product in, in the, um, the Escalade SUV. It's, you know, the best selling luxury SUV. Um, that thing just prints money. Um, then they had critical su- successes in their cars, like the CTS and the ATS, especially when you look at the V version. So, uh, even if they weren't huge sales hits, they, they were written about well, and they, they reflected well on the brand. The problem was despite those two things, the best selling passenger cars, at least if it, the best selling vehicles actually, um, of the whole Cadillac brand at the time were the XTS, which, which is the. Um, you know, the old person's Cadillac that everyone forgets they even make, but they actually sell a ton of. Um, and the XT5, which what was the name of the XT5? The before? SRX. The SRX. So, and the SRX was the bestseller. And they let the SRX wither on the vine for a long time, and yet it was still the best selling. So, in some respects, I think Cadillac has made a right move in that they've begun introducing more crossovers they have the xt i mean but they haven't they they, they've introduced one new cross or two new crossovers and only one of them is on sale right but that's a step in the right direction i mean that's better than having just one i mean now they're gonna they're gonna go from basically two suvs to four so that's that's good granted i'm not saying that those two new suvs are great products i'm not and and there's there's a bigger problem though is you 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 said it before. They they allowed the SRX to wither on the vine, and they are a lot. And the Escalade is old as hell. It's still good. It's it's but it's not good relative to the Navigator or a Range Rover or the new the upcoming Mercedes GLS. They've gone ahead and they have these two key products: one that prints money and one that is the most popular product they make. That are old, old, old. And now they've gone and introduced two new sedans. Right. That's what I think you boiled, we can boil down Cadillac's issue to, is the fact that where every other automaker is taking their resources, their R&D, their budgets, and putting them towards SUVs and crossovers and away from cars, Cadillac just can't quit cars. Like it keeps, like, like we have the all new CT4 and the all new CT5 when we should have all new versions of their SUVs and crossovers. And, and they can't just sit on their laurels and, and let the XT5 and the, the Escalade do all the work and the XTS. Like they put so much effort into these other sedans and yet the XTS, which has been like the same for eight years, outsells those cars that they're putting so much money into. If I'm a Cadillac customer and I want a car, I just want a soft thing that reminds me of an old Cadillac. And then everybody else wants crossovers. <laughs> like that's it. That's all you got to do. I think part of the problem, it, it seems like Cadillac is still stuck on this this thing that well we're Cadillac, you know you you look at some of some of the press that they that they did following the XT6 and this car would be or this version of a crossover that's more or less the same as a lot of the other GM crossovers will be successful because it's a Cadillac. It has a Cadillacness to it, and they're so high and mighty on on their ego that they're not realizing that they're being left in the dust by by Lincoln. I would love to have a whole podcast on Lincoln versus Cadillac because Lincoln. It's going to be a case study in product planning and marketing and well, messaging, and we'll see. I think. I forward. think that. I think critics like us like uh, Lincoln's lineup a lot right now, but you know we still have to wait many months to see if that bears out in sales for Lincoln. The, I definitely um, agree. It might, if for any other reason they're just selling more models than they have been for the last ten years. But 
It could um, though. It could if they get their branding and their marketing strategy right. And I mean, Brandon hit it square on the head. Cadillac, and and I'll just jump back a little bit further here, John. You said, "Oh, it's always." I'll jump back a little bit further. Cadillac, more than any other American auto company, I think, has been trying to become German, so to speak. If you follow what I'm saying, uh, and and in many ways, rightfully so. When German automakers started to really have a strong presence in the U.S. market through the 80s. That upstep in quality and design, it, it needed to happen. But has Cadillac gone too far to try to become a German brand? Could the could the CT5V be better as a Seville or an Eldorado? Maybe Cadillac should start to think about bringing back actual names to the models and getting their getting their marketing focused using some of that branding using some of that heritage when you look at Lincoln Lincoln got rid of the MKZ MKX MKT alphabet soup of stuff that nobody could even sort out and now you have Aviator and Nautilus naming cars with like specific names is a really uniquely kind of American thing and when you start having XT4 XT5 CT4 CT it all kind of blends together and I have to question whether that was a poor decision just on the branding side that Cadillac made years ago that Lincoln is now starting to address. I wonder if Cadillac could go in that same direction. I disagree with that because you go back and look at, you know, some of the marketing that came out immediately after uh, the CTS arrived. And that was really the first alphanumeric, or no, the SRX was the first, first alphanumeric, but then the CTS showed up and, you look at some of the marketing, like the uh, the cam- the campaign that they had with uh, I want to say it was ZZ Top playing in the background, featuring the CTS, and it was it was a great marketing campaign. It was it was enjoyable. And so they they can do it. They have the wherewithal to to find people that can market their cars and market them effectively. Naming is naming is not the issue. I think the I think it is just a symptom in a bigger problem that shows a lack of of leadership and understanding of what the brand needs to be. I think going back to at least some names for Cadillac products could reinvigorate American audiences. Cadillac has this ego thing. Well, Cadillac was the premier world luxury brand for decades, decades, and they didn't do it with a CTS. They did it with an Eldorado Baritz. Let's retap some of that, that brand equity. Not all models have to have names. But if you can if you can embrace some of that brand equity, let, let, let's let's do a recast. They had that they had that brand equity in the 60s and 70s. And then the 80s rolled around and the Cimarron came out and the Katera. But that didn't was, that that didn't those names but, like didn't kill names for them. I think. Well, let's look at it this way. I, but the, I'm, they, saying, they I'm saying the, the American impression of Cadillac changed irreversibly then. And no, the company is struggling to find struggling to find a new identity since then. And they were starting to stumble onto one by saying, we're going to be the, you know, the, the German, we're going to be German, but American, but distinctly American. And it worked then, but it's, but it's not working now. They lost that single minded focus and they're trying to do something different. And they're not really, it doesn't seem like they know exactly what they want to be. When I see a car company like blanket change all their cars names from either regular words to alphanumerics or vice versa, I usually think there's somebody new in the company and they want to make their mark and do something to say they did something. Oh, you're so right. Yes. And I think that's probably how Cadillac ended up with alphanumeric names is because somebody just wanted to be like, you know, I I need to prove why you hired me. So I'm going to make an argument for doing this. Now, the reason I, I kind of agree with Chris and that going back to names might be a good idea is because one Lincoln does prove like if, if the alphanumeric names mark an era where your cars weren't good, then get rid of the alphanumeric names and go back to other, to, to real names to start a new era. Uh, and I think Cadillac could use a reset. Also, it is still using a, a full vehicle name, the Escalade. It refuses to give up the Escalade name because if there's something that should be a it should be its own sub trim, it should be Escalade. I want I want an XT4 Escalade, an XT6 Escalade. I want all of the, I want the ultra luxury version. Yeah, but Escalade to be Escalade, Escalade though is is branded has a big SUV though. It's it would make no sense on a car. 
Yeah, to me, if they did that, that would be like a marketing person coming in and saying, "We should do this because I'm new here and I." Need but to here's the thing: myself. you have all you have all of your brand equity in this one model line. Everybody knows if you say Escalade, yeah, everybody that's a good point. Immediately knows Cadillac. And if you turn around and say, "We're going to we're going to distill the Escalade and filter it into our other products, just our SUVs, not our cars, just our SUVs," you can have Escalade SUVs and V sedans. And you have a two-tier approach that you can market and say, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we're all about. It's these two things. These are our identity, our performance and Escalade. I actually, I I kind of like that idea uh, because right now the the like the the absolute highest trim level on on Cadillac uh, SUVs. At Name least, one. I I can't plat- I can't even think of it. I don't know. It's platinum, but. Which means like, nothing because Ford's got right, a platinum. Five other Nissan brands, has a platinum. right? Five other brands use platinum, so it would be kind of that. That's an interesting idea. If I were CEO and you pitched that to me, I could I could see getting on board with that. Well, make make it make it the Baritz. Get rid of platinum because it's kind of generic. Baritz means nothing. Baritz means Baritz nothing. Baritz was the top Cadillac brand for decades, though. The only person that knows that was born in 1966. No, I mean, they, 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 I was born later than that, Brandon. Come on. But you're a car guy. What about other? What you, about other you are words? A car guy. Like Brougham or um, Escalade. Everybody today knows. Right, right. Escalade. I mean, he, he's that just is, coming up with an idea for cars instead of SUVs. Just SUVs. People know Escalade has an SUV. To me, it just doesn't make sense as a car. If if you want to, I'm not do saying that. they should do it as a car. Cars sell in far fewer numbers. They're, they're not going to be nearly as popular. You can afford to be a little bit different. You don't need to have an equivalent. You can say, you know, we have the luxury versions. If you want a car, you're obviously a little bit more in tune. You want something that drives a little bit better. You can have V. That is that is what you get. You, you the danger the danger that that I think Cadillac faces is that they try to do too much, and that would be doing too much. You have an established brand right now for cars that you're trying to build on, which I think is the right step. Uh, I want to be clear that I think what Cadillac is, their their plans with V of making it a multi-tier thing the way that AMG has, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it was executed poorly in this particular case. They already had the V Sport and the V, so it's not like they're changing that. They still have that. They're just renaming them. And then, and that's the question: is is will Blackwing now be their ultimate performance division? Will Blackwing be their ultimate luxury performance division? We we don't know, and that's part of the problem right now that we're all in agreement on is that we don't know what the hell Cadillac is doing. We just know that they brought out these two new V sedans that we were expecting to be really hot, and the horsepower is a little disappointing. So. Cadillac, where where we go from here, man? The frustrating the frustrating thing is, for me is that if Cadillac hadn't rushed these cars, and, and I'm assuming that they rushed these cars to the Grand Prix, we don't know if that's the case. We don't know that for a fact, but just based on the evidence at hand, they rushed these cars out to the Grand Prix. If they hadn't done that, this story would have died after this news cycle. It wouldn't have lasted. But Maybe, they gave the but- story legs by by suddenly coming out and saying, "Wait, wait, wait, wait! There's more." If they had just said from the start that these are RVs, there are more coming based on these with more power. That's all it would have taken. You're absolutely right on that. They gave the story leg. I, I kind of disagree because and that's why we're talking about it. I, now. I, I, I think their, their flaw happened earlier by using the CTA, the, the, the dash V name on these two cars. They introduced with such little I, horsepower. What, what I'm saying is that by rushing these cars out and saying there's more, they've caused other outlets, you know, some of our, our colleagues at Automotive News to ask questions of their leadership. And the leadership is saying things now that is not a good look. And you look at an exchange between uh, Mark Royce and Patrick George over at Jalopnik, and it was Royce just kind of stepping in it after he gave a bad quote to Automotive News of saying these cars were these cars were hammers you know i think they kind of intimidated some drivers and that is the kind of messaging that is it it doesn't make them look good that's like saying i think some customers were 
too much of a wussy to drive our cars. So we had to... Right. So we tuned them. So we had the... <laughs> yeah, that's not a good message. It's not a good message. So, I mean, it, that's what I say when the messaging on this has been kind of botched from the start. All of that said, I still have... I'm super excited to drive the cars. I, I, yeah. And, and me too. <laughs> I want to I want to be the, clear. The CT4? I'm, I'm really excited because I, I love the idea of a light, medium power, small sedan. I think it's. I think it'll be a riot to drive, and the reality is that Cadillac do, and GM as a whole do know how to make performance vehicles. Yep. They make fantastic sure. performance vehicles. Yeah. So I don't. I, I don't want it to sound like we're knocking the CT four V and the CT five V so much as the the motivations behind. Can them. we just call them CT four V Sport and CT five V Sport? I feel totally comfortable with that. And the CT four V. Yeah, I no one would bet. No one would bet an eyelash if that had been what happened. I bet that'll be a riot. It's supposed to have 50 50 weight distribution. Everything. Yeah. All of it sounds good. If anybody wants to keep the conversation going on the um, Cadillac craziness, though, um, we've got lots of articles up on MotorOne.com that you can leave a comment on, and we'll join you there and have a conversation. I want to move on, though, to something that surprised me this week, which was the Ford versus Ferrari, Ferrari movie trailer. For those of you who don't know, um, there's a movie coming out in November called Ford versus Ferrari, and it's the story of how Ford decided it was going to beat Ferrari at Le Mans in, I believe, the 60s. Basically, hired Carroll Shelby um, to develop and build what would become the GT40 to take on Ferrari in that famous endurance race. This movie stars Matt Damon. And who does Christian Bale play? Ken Miles. The, Ken Miles, who's the driver, one of the drivers they picked. And I, honestly, I don't I don't know too much about Ken Miles, so I'm kind of looking forward to the movie to learn more about him. What did you guys think of this trailer? I'm sure you both watched it already. I kind of have a little bit of history with Ford. Um, I know a little bit about that whole Ford versus Ferrari rivalry in the beginning. So I'm really anxious to see how it uh, it translates to the big screen to see if they are accurate to what happened. If they do some dramatization, I, if I remember correctly in the trailer, there's, there's a scene where I think, uh, you know, Matt Damon, Matt Damon's Carol Shelby is saying that oh, we've got like 90 days or something to build in. And I mean, the original, the original GT 40 project was a little bit longer than 90 days, but uh, I mean, for the sake of Hollywood, if you want to inject some dramatics into it, I'm, I'm fine with that. That's, I mean, it, it, it looks pretty good. I'm excited to see it. I, I agree with Chris. I worry about the dramatization, especially some of the, some of the bigger themes. There's very much the presentation from, uh, from what I've seen in the trailers that this is an American underdog story and Ford is, you know, Ford is fighting against this, this European automaker to try and beat them at their own game. And it has, it all has a very much like a uh, miracle on ice vibe to it. <laughs> and, but, but if you look, if you look at the history and if you study a little bit more, Ford was kind of bad. Oh yeah. You're not wrong. The the reason the reason this all came up and Chris you probably, you might know this better than I do, so correct me if I'm wrong, but Ford wanted to buy Ferrari. Mm-hmm. And all Ferrari wanted in the deal was that he would be continued would be allowed to continue running the racing divisions. And that was all Ferrari wanted from the start. You look back at the guy's uh, his earliest history, and he was running racing teams. He was you mean Enzo Ferrari. Enzo, Ferrari. yes, Enzo. yes. Enzo has always been about the racing first. And when Ford was like, "Well, absolutely not. You can't do that. Your cars compete with us at Indianapolis. We're not. We're not going to have that." And so Enzo torpedoed the deal. Right. And that was when Ford freaked out and said, "Well, no, we're going to go and." beat the hell out of him at, at, at Lama. And, but uh, the impression that I get from the trailer is that this is, this is some heartwarming story about American Anglo American ingenuity beating the big mean Italian. And I mean, to some degree, you're going to have that. It will be in there. I mean, I mean, Carol Shelby came on board. He was the one that really gave the GT 40, the power that it needed. The, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the Mark one was still using the, I think the smaller 4.2 liter V eight, and that original Mark One, it didn't meet with a lot of success. It, it wasn't until the Mark Two that uh, that they really got things dialed in. And Ford's Ford's first year at Le Mans, they, they I don't think any of the cars finished, did they? Nope. And uh, and the the development really isn't just Carroll Shelby. If there's if I have any concerns about this movie, it's it's that it's going to portray uh, Carroll has just the brainchild behind the whole thing, and and for. For the amazing person he was, for the driver, for the uh, for the designer, 
he he wasn't really the one pushing and designing and pulling all the strings on the Ford GT or the the, G, the GT40 back in the day. So I mean that's that's kind of my big concern there. And I'm I'm interested to see how some of the other aspects are uh, are included in the film. Um I, I know car craft racing um in Michigan had a lot to do um if I remember correctly Roy Lunn um Ford Internal was the guy well one of the guys that that was primarily on the on the program. Um I will say this how cool would it have been at that time to be in Ford and to basically have um, Edsel Ford the, the second come up and say, okay, here's a blank check. Do what you want. I mean, ugh. he seems completely insufferable in the trailers. Like there, there's so much like eye rolling, like dialogue of like, you know, Ford motors gone to war before and we can do it again. Go to war, Mr. Shelby. It's just like, and then the, it's just, it's just silly. I mean, and I meant to say Henry Ford, the second there, not a, not Edsel. I think uh, to me, and I had always seen the story this way, is that it was a battle of egos between the two companies, oh, you know, yeah. between en- Enzo and Henry Ford. Carroll Shelby and, and his team is just caught in the middle as the, you know, the the group that got tasked with this, imp- with this and, and quite frankly, it was a, a very tall order to ask, you know, a team or a company to come up out of nowhere and take on Ferrari in this race. You know, Ferrari was extremely successful, <laughs> you know, like that would be like taking on the giant in, 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 you know, any industry. Well, and, and uh, Ford, I mean, keep in mind, Ford had a lot of help back then. Um, I mean, it, it was a British chassis that they were working. Yeah, with. It was a Lola chassis. I mean, well, that they was the point. Resources. I mean, Ford Ford basically said, blank check, all resources are yours. I just want to defend my ego and beat Enzo. I would love I mean, to know how was. much it actually cost. You know, I, that's that's something that I've never seen over the years. How much did it actually cost to do this? You know? Yeah, especially like do it in today's dollars oh. and see like like <laughs> how many hundreds of millions they, they would have spent just to do that. I mean, you couldn't get away with that today. Oh, no. I mean, companies are too financially uh, held, like too, too much held accountable to stockholders and things like that you can't just go off on a personal vendetta and spend a, and 300 million dollars on something to, to beat somebody else as fun as that would be car companies wouldn't be around if they were doing that we were talking a little bit this about this uh when this trailer came up i love movies that are that take the stories out of the automotive industry and turn them into these dramas or comedies or whatever i love movies about the car industry and car racing. Some of my favorites. One is, hopefully everybody remembers this one, Gung Ho with Michael Keaton. It was the story of an American car manufacturing plant that gets bought by the Japanese and then the Japanese come in and try to make all the Americans work like the Japanese work. And it's hilarious and perfectly plays on the stereotypes of both American workers and Japanese workers. Uh, I could watch that movie uh, all day, every day. It, It really holds up. And then another one, which I was surprised that you had never heard of, Chris, called Flash of Genius. And it's not that old. It's like from 2008 or something. But it's the story of the guy who invented the intermittent wiper. It's an amazing story. It's just this one guy who invented this thing we all take for granted today. Uh, and it's the story about how the, the U.S. automakers screwed him out of um, the money he deserved and kind of ruined his life. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to really check that idea. out. It, you've, you've piqued my interest on that. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of Rush that came out in 2013 with you know the story of... Uh, James Hunt and Nikki Lauda uh, in, in F1. I'm not a big F1 fan, but just the way that movie was done, uh, th- that's one that I could just watch over and over. The two stars of it are um, Chris Hemsworth and what's the other guy's name? Oh, God, remember. I can't remember his name. Well, I, regardless was, of his name, was, Daniel, was Daniel Brühl. In, yeah, Daniel Brühl. That's it. So both of those guys are in the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic yeah, Universe. You've got Daniel Thor. Daniel Brühl is Baron Zemo. Yeah, Baron Zemo. So I was just go. watching Civil that. War last night. Six degrees of separation from the MCU, which is pretty easy to do nowadays since everybody has been in the MCU. Co- completely off topic, the the new MIB movie with uh, Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson, who played Valkyrie in Thor, is also going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. And they're, and they're, get, they're playing that off in the movie, too. I've seen some of the clips where they're like, uh, you know, what he's trying to like pull a hammer towards him. He's like, why isn't this working? Oh, I haven't seen that. I'm not to watch that. That's- <laughs> what's the what's the car company that got the licensing deal with that movie, with the MIB movie? Um, uh, Lexus. 
Lexus is yeah, that's new, right. Lexus, Lexus is in it. They're driving around a Lexus. So I don't know. I don't well, know if it's uh, licensing deal, but they're they're definitely there's definitely an RCF. No, it is. I, I saw some press releases from Lexus okay. touting right. it. So they definitely paid to be in the movie for sure. Um, all right, uh, moving on. The other big news of the week, kind of sad news. Um, Ian Callum has um, is stepping down from his role as design director at Jaguar, which he's held for so long. Um, I think it's safe to say that. Everyone here and probably most people out there believe that Jaguars are beautiful cars today. Uh, and that's because of this man, Ian Callum, um, who took over after the whole, um, uh, what were some of the cars that came right before him? What was the Mondeo based one? The X-Type. Uh, yeah, the X-Type. That was right before Ian Callum. Uh, he came on and he, I think he started with like the XF, um, which, which really, you know, uh, hit the scene and was, was super impressive. Um, I believe he was the, was he the XK as well or, or only the F type? No, I, I think he was XK as well. Yeah. XK was great. Uh, I, I, I still love that car to this day. I, I don't like convertibles and the Jaguar XK convertible is one of the few convertibles I've liked in my, in my, in my time. Um, he presided over a lot of concept, great concept cars. Uh, as well, uh, some of which appeared in movies like Bond movies. Before he was a Jaguar, he was at Ford and Aston Martin and de- even did some work for some racing teams that ended up with Nissan. So just a a pillar of the automotive design community. Do you guys have any favorite cars in the Jaguar lineup or in Ian Callum's portfolio that you really like? The XK stands out to me. I, I'm looking at a picture of it right now and I'm just remembering how much I adore that shape. I mean, it's got to be the DB9. It, I mean, the, there, there's been there's been no model from Aston Martin that's had such a dramatic impact on on their overall design language. It's still reverberating today, and it's such a such a classic shape. It's such a good looking car, and it's aged beautifully. It has, yeah. Actually, all I I would say all of the Aston Martins of his era. Um, have not only aged beautifully, but I still picture them when someone says that Aston Martin to me. I do not picture the new Aston Martins. That's that's those. true. That's true. The very true, right there. Um, I would pick the Jaguar F Type. It's currently on sale. To me, at, of all the modern cars, that does for Jaguar to me what the the Aston Martins did of his era for Aston Martin. Like when I think of a Jaguar now, I think of F Type. He was involved uh, when he was at Ford with the Ford RS200, um, which was that weird mid-engine four-wheel drive uh, sports car that was homologated in Group B rally car racing. Only like 200 were produced for sale. But I remember when I was a kid and reading car magazines, I came across the Ford RS200 and it boggled my mind because it could do zero to 60 in like the low three seconds. And that was back in, in the eighties. <laughs> so th- this, that car was amazing and it didn't look like any other Ford either. So, um, he had his fingerprints on that one too. It's not a pretty um, car though. He also did the S he also did the escort Cosworth. I mean, that is yeah, more was, of a pretty car. Oh, I love the look of that car with that giant wing on the top of the windshield or uh, rear window. Yeah, and kind of like the the louvers or the vents in the hood. Yeah, that's that's a great car as well. Um, yeah, I mean, he really doesn't have uh, a stinker in the bunch. He even did the Ford uh, Puma, which was from kind of the late 90s. It was like an economy hatchback in Europe. You could tell it had so much design intention in it. Um, and it, it's always, cars like that have always made me feel like when I see an economy car for like $15,000 new, that is just designed like nobody cared. It's like you don't have to charge extra for the design. You could just hire a good designer and let their vision go rather than, you know, doing everything you can to suck all that out because you're trying to get what customers to pay more for a better looking car. Um, no, the, the, the cars like the Puma showed like, no, you can give uh, people who are going to be buying at a more affordable price point great design and they'll appreciate it. All right, so we'd love to hear uh, hear more about what you guys think of these news stories and everything we've talked about. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com and, of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, where all of this will continue in the comments. Coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. And before we take a break, uh, just a reminder that if you're listening to this online, uh, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. 
So please subscribe to us there so you don't miss an episode uh, every week. Uh, We come out every Friday. Um, So uh, let's take a break and we'll be back. Now it's time for our final segment, What Are We Driving This Week, where we go around the table and talk about what car we're driving and what has struck us most about it. Uh, Chris, let me start with you because I know you have actually driven a few cars this week. Yeah, I'm I'm actually considering upgrading my personal garage. I've got my 2004 Mazda 6 that's been serving me well, but it's getting along in years. And rather than investing in maintenance, I've been thinking about new cars. So um, I went out and shopped the, (laughs) it's kind of an odd combination, the Jeep Gladiator, the Kia Soul X-Line, and the new Mazda 3. And I got to be honest, sorry for the, for the Jeep people, the Gladiator drives I think I thought I thought it drove really good. I was comfortable inside. I think it's just beyond cool, which is why I went to look at it in the first place. Admittedly, I'm not much of a truck guy. I've never really been a big truck fan. Um, I don't really have a need for a, for that kind of space. It's just me and my wife. We we don't do a lot of hauling. Uh, we don't haul a lot of trailers. But I wanted to see what the Gladiator was like as a possible new daily. It's still a truck. Let's be honest. It's it still rides like a truck. I'm um, hitting some of the bumps around town here. I just thought, oh, that's that's just going to be a little bit rougher than I want to go. I'm not saying that um, that it's terrible by any means. Um, I mean, compared to some of the other trucks out there, it, it actually goes pretty smooth, but it's just not going to fit my bill very well. Now, uh, being a Mazda guy, I'm really interested in the new Mazda 3. I think the new 2019 model uh, just looks fantastic. Um, I love the way it just they just kind of arrowed it up on the outside. Um the, Which one were you looking at? The hatch or the, 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 the hatch, the hatchback the hatch. Um, the downside to that though, is um, it's just, you lose a lot of space inside. It feels like you lose a lot of space. You lose a lot of visibility. And I was actually, I, I don't get claustrophobic and I was starting to feel a little just closed in while I was driving that car. Um, I think Jeff Perez was talking about it last week. Uh, he had kind of the opposite take that, uh, you know, hey, it's pretty good inside. For me, um, and, and a big thing that I noticed, too, um, opening up the rear hatch, now that it's it's a little more arrowed and kind of kind of sloped down at the back, um, the, the interior space just isn't, just not the same, um, especially the opening, you know, when you open up the hatch. That's yeah. actually really narrow. Um, I I mean, I would, I would suspect you might have some trouble just even getting some, some like smaller bookcases or something in there if you needed to move something a little bit bigger by comparison. And I've said this before, and I'm going to continue to brag. I hauled a washing machine in my Mazda six with the hatch closed. And that's, that's not the wagon. That was the five door hatch. So it's kind of, maybe it's a little bit of a, of a bad comparison. You you, you have a, you have a high bar. (laughs) It's, it is a pretty high bar. Um, and I I certainly wouldn't expect to do that really in, in any new Mazda three, even the, the previous generation, which I also drove. And I, I still think that car is actually, um, better from an interior perspective. The, th- the third one, the one that I might end up pulling the trigger on is the Kia Soul. It's, a, it's the brand new, uh, the new 2020, the, the X-Line model. And and the X-Line is like the kind of butch, off-road-ish looking one. Yeah, it's a, it, it has the extra trim on the side. It's got, a, it's got the nice wheels. It drove really well. I thought it was a comfortable ride. Um, it has decent interior space. Um, the X line, the, the only downside is they do keep it pretty thin on options. Um, you, you don't get anything like, like, like even power seats, never mind like a heated seat. Um, it's a key instead of a push button start, which, which really doesn't bother me that much, but it, I mean, it does have a backup camera and some driver assists. And of course, I mean, it's got the Bluetooth and all of that. So, and really that, that suits my needs more than anything. I would like to have some of the nicer options like heated seats and things. Um, but the power, I mean, it's, it, it wasn't the turbo. I can't remember the exact engine size in there, but I was comfortably impressed with the power that it had. Um, I was going to drive the, the GT turbo and I, I didn't even bother. I said, uh, I'm happy with this. Let's just stick looking at this. So of those three, that's probably, uh, that could be the one I pull the trigger on. That's funny. The, the Mazda three is what, uh, Jeff drove, uh, last week and talked about on last week, pod, last week's podcast and the X line, uh, the soul X line is what I drove and talked about on last week's podcast. So somehow you, you may have listened to the podcast and subconsciously got them s- stuck in your craw. All right, Brandon, uh, what about you? What are you driving this week? 
I just returned today the BMW M4 CS. Uh, it's a limited edition version of the M4 Coupe, a car that doesn't make a great deal of sense. I, I like the I like the M4 quite a lot. I this is the first one, first time I've driven one in a few years, and I I don't remember liking it this much previously. But it's it's a very enjoyable car to drive. The uh, straight six engine is fantastic. It sounds good. It feels good. It handles well, but I have a few problems with this car, and the first one is the price. This is a limited edition model. Uh, BMW is not going to build very many of them. I've been trying to find out exactly how many they'll build, but the starting price on it is $103,100. The current M4 starts at $69,150. So, so this this vehicle is thirty four thousand dollars more expensive. My tester adds a beautiful San Marino blue metallic paint for five hundred and fifty dollars, and M carbon ceramic brakes for eight thousand one hundred and fifty dollars. So, along with destination, the total price is one hundred and twelve thousand seven hundred ninety five dollars. If you know anything about BMW M history, you know the letters CSL were attached to one of the most famous famous versions of the M3 Coupe. This car's a uh, distant relative. So you would walk into this thinking, well, it's going to be lighter. It's going to be a bit more hardcore. It's going to be you know, more of a track-focused toy. And I never really got that impression that it was any of those things while I was driving it. It has carbon fiber elements. So it has a carbon fiber roof, which you can also get on the M4. It has carbon fiber uh, front splitter and a carbon fiber rear spoiler and these lovely black wheels and it all looks very good in the in in the interior has carbon fiber door panels matte finish they are not uh, the glossy finish that you would find on the roof or the front splitter despite that they don't really feel any lighter the doors are just about as heavy and that would be fine but when you when you present this car as being this you know this hardcore lightweight version why do I have heated se- or uh, heated power seats? Why do I have air conditioning? I only have single zone air conditioning, but still air conditioning, climate control. I have navigation. I have a good stereo. It's an automatic only. They won't sell this car as a, with a manual transmission. It's because no one really wants the lightweight version. They, you know, they want the look, the look of the lightweight version, but I still want all my creature comforts. And, and, this, and this car does look super, super cool. I, I love the way it looked. I'm, I'm actually really sad that it went away because I did enjoy driving it. But the problem is... That's a huge markup, though. For It's a you know. huge markup. And here's the problem. Wouldn't you rather have a 911 Carrera T? You, it, which, starts at, which starts at about $100,000, 100, $102,000. You yeah, can get it sure. with carbon ceramic brakes and a manual transmission for about the same price as my test car. And then you're driving a 911, and not just any 911, but one that is going to be exceedingly rare. One that'll still have some of its value in the in the next 60 <laughs> yeah. years or so. Precisely. So, I mean, the, there's a lot that I like about this car. I I think it's fantastic. Um, it's it. I I don't really care for for the messaging on it. I would rather have it go one way or the other, either be just a normal M4 or be a proper CSL. I, um, I I agree, but I think they'll they'll sell all of them they make. Oh, to- there's a lot absolutely! Of BMW fanatics who are going to buy the M4 who will just pony up uh, the extra yeah. because they want the best. the The other thing that's worth noting is that this car is a little bit more powerful. It's uh, the current the the standard M3 gets sixty in four point one seconds. This one has four hundred fifty three horsepower and gets there in three point seven seconds. So you are getting a small performance gain, but it it it's not thirty thousand dollars. It's it's not a thirty thousand dollar performance gain. And I think that that brings us neatly on to the car that I would have, and that's the one that John has been driving. Uh, thank you for segueing. Uh, you like, you you like did, that? You did the hard, hard part for me. <laughs> so uh, this past, uh, this week, I am driving the BMW M2 competition, um, which is the smallest, lightest, most affordable M product that BMW sells now. And a lot of people argue it's the best uh, because of those things. Um, I've only had it for a couple days. Uh, I did my trademark grocery run with it and it performed admirably. 
Um, it's got uh, over 400 horsepower, I think 405, from a uh, wonderful uh, sounding and and extremely powerful uh, twin turbo three liter inline six. Um, it uh, BMW quotes it as as doing zero to sixty in four point two seconds, and that both sounds and feels conservative uh, to me. Um, and the one I have is the manual version, um, which is fun. Um, six speed manual instead of the seven speed dual clutch. So I haven't had a manual car in a while. I hear a lot of people say it's the best M car because it's lighter weight and it's smaller. And that's more in line with what, you know, M cars of the past used to be. And I guess that's true, but you know, it's only light relatively speaking. It's still a modern car with, you know, all of the safety equipment and, and, and weight uh, and luxury, you know, all the weight that comes from, you know, the sound deadening and all that. So it's not like it's, it's not like one of those old cars where it feels analog or anything like that, but it is just, it's just that size of like that wraps around you and that you feel like, you know, where each corner is and that, that you can see each corner, um, that gives you a lot of confidence when you're driving. Um, I really like that. Also the shape of it, it isn't like a windswept coupe shape. It's more like a like an upright coupe shape. It's a good looking um, car. It's a very it, good looking shape. It's a it's a very good looking car. And because of that shape, though, you know, when I got out of it uh, last night, uh, I looked at the back seat and where I put the front seat, and I'm like, man, there's decent leg room back there, like for the second row, which you know in sport coupes is not usually the case. Um, but I appreciate, and also the trunk. You know, it's again, it's got it's not it's not like you know aerodynamically windswept it's it's a, like a normal car proportion it's a usable uh, car a totally usable car like if i were if i were a, a young man an up and coming professional um i could see this being like you know you know when i made it and got my promotion this would be the car i'd go out and get and plus you said your bmw was over 100 this one's um 64,000 out the door which and that is, that is reasonable for that level of performance I agree. I think that's that's you know it's not something we say often of BMWs, but I think that's reasonable for what you're getting. Fifty-eight thousand nine hundred, so about fifty-nine. So it, I, it's only got like five thousand dollars worth of options, which again for a BMW is a low amount. So in my in my consistently huge queue of cars to write about, I have a M2 competition with the dual clutch transmission. So I I'm I'm somewhat familiar with this. I had it uh, a couple months ago. And I, I definitely get what you're saying that it feels it kind of wraps around you and you know exactly where it's at. And that was one of the problems with the M4 is it's not a big car. It's it's f- just over 15 feet long. The M2 feels so much better. It's like something you're wearing. You you, you don't realize how tight and compact and, and approachable it is until you until you've driven both of them. It's 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 just a more likable car, especially at that price. And I, one thing I noticed, and I, I didn't get to push it hard, and I, I, you know, but it's got so much tire. It felt like oh yeah, it's it, unflappable. It, yeah, like it, it you just you, felt like the grip was was. It, I, it felt like I couldn't lose grip at all. It felt just glued to the ground because there's so much tire. Yeah, it's it's such a it's such an all around excellent product, and i, I kind of wish i had driven the the m2 the standard m2 not the m2 competition which is i think is all they really build now just to just to compare the two because i don't remember the reception to it being that po- to the standard model being that positive but everything i've seen and heard and experienced in the m2 competition has just been glowing yeah i agree i haven't driven the the regular um two series as well um and would like to try it let's let's actually we should get that on the list and um you still owe me yeah, your list sir like. I do, I do. I'll get that to you. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show this week. Um, you can follow Chris on Twitter at ch writing and Brandon at Brandon Turkis, and you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, thank you guys for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, John. And thank all of you out there for listening, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>